they've given me a little stepping stool so I can see all of you and you can see me. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for, um, for, for, for coming here, for being here um, and sharing space with me. I feel really grateful every time I get to talk about my practice with people. Um, but before that, I wanna say thank you to Bob and to um, Christina and to the um, Madison Museum of Contemporary Arts and their staff for being so generous in your um, uh, and welcoming me. Um, and then lastly, um, I would like to say thank you to Stefan um, uh, Fleischmann um, for your generous um, support in bringing me here and um, in allowing me to sort of have this space. So thank you so much. I'm gonna talk about my practice um, in chronological order. Um, and I think that that's really helpful in understanding where I come from and then also like where the work could potentially be going. Um, um, and so uh, in order for me to do that, I think it's really important to talk about my practice and who I am um, as a person because who I am very much feeds into like the work that I make. So um, I was uh, born in Laos uh, and my family came to America, specifically to the Twin Cities in the uh, mid 80s. Um, we came to um, Minnesota in the winter. I remember it being really cold, uh, not knowing what this white stuff on the ground was. And then also like thinking about um, Christmas too is something that like was very new to me. Um, and so that becomes really important, right? And my parents um, lived in three refugee camps before we came here to America. Um, they, my father also fought in the war um, as a child. And so all of that for me is like really important in, um, in thinking about my practice as an artist and also like as a Hmong woman. Um, the first body of work I'm gonna talk about is a body of work titled Attention. Um, and this body of work um, was shown at the Minneapolis College of Arts, um, Minneapolis Institute of Arts in 2015. Um, so like I've stated uh, earlier, uh, or like um, um, the war is very present and um, in uh, Hmong history and in sort of the context of like what it means to be a Hmong person in America, right? Um, and so, um, um, uh, you know, just to give you a really short overview, um, you know, um, in 1960s, mid 1960s, the US government asked uh, General Vang Pao to uh, gather Hmong men to help uh, the Americans clear Ho Chi Minh Trail that runs through um, um, uh, um, Thailand into Vietnam. Um, you know, ask uh, you know General Vang Pao to help them uh, help. They asked General Vang Pao to ask Hmong people, uh, Hmong men, to help them clear this trail. So that's what he did. And one of the rules was that um, you can only fight in the war if you were taller than the gun that you um, that that you were using to fight. And so oftentimes, a lot of these soldiers were um, young boys um, and really not even men yet, right? And so like my father was a young boy soldier. Um, and so I think that that for me became really important. Um, so I was always like known about this war. You know, my dad didn't really talk about the war, but other people I've read about the war in books, and I've um, and I've seen these sort of um, older Hmong men in these Hmong uniforms, and was well was really interested in like who they were and how they were connected to the war. Um, and so I started looking at um, Hmong, um, older Hmong men, right? Um, uh, especially in the Twin Cities. Um, and um, the story that I always give, and I think I'll tell this story too, because I think the story is really important in how I came to this body of work and why I made this body of work. Um, I was in graduate school at Yale, and um, one weekend I came back home, and my parents had asked if I wanted to go to a funeral, and I said, sure, why not? 
I went to this funeral, didn't know who, I knew that it was an uncle that had passed away, but didn't know like who he was. Um, and when I was at this funeral, um, waiting for this funeral to begun, um, there were these three men dressed in white, Hmong men, um, who played the trumpet, um, a song that sort of felt really familiar, but also felt really off key. I didn't know what they were playing, but I could like sort of make out what they were playing. And then um, right behind them uh, were six men, three men on each side, all in military uniform, uh, rolling down my uncle who had passed away um, with a, um, um, an American flag uh, draped over his coffin. Um, I was like, what is this? I did not know like who these people were, knew that they probably, um, that my uncle probably fought in the war, but didn't know what this was. Um, and so, you know, the funeral proceeded after the um, service. I went up to one of the men um, who I'd known, my friend's father, and said, um, like, what part of the military branch are you guys from? Like, this is like so fascinating. And he said, oh, we're not part of any military branch. And I said, wait, but you guys are wearing uniforms and um, like you guys have pins and uh, like, what is this? And he said, oh yeah, we like, we, we bought these ourselves. And, and then I said, okay, like, you you what? And he said, yeah, I bought, we bought these ourselves. And we're actually the special um, guerrillas unit. And we, you know, we have a chapter here in the Twin Cities. And, you know, and so like he went on about this history that I had no, like didn't know anything about. Um, and I was completely fascinated. And so I came back home and um, started doing research. Um, during that time, I also um, had gone to um, uh, the National Portrait Gallery and was looking at um, like portraits from um, that gallery. Was also then looking at um, you know uh, military portraits too, um, and you know was really thinking about how I can then go and make um, make this work. Like, what is it? I wanted to photograph these men, but like in a way that, um, I don't know, like that like talked about the complexity of what it means to be among older men who fought in the war, but who also was not, you know, has like been erased from the war, who is trying to then put themselves back into a narrative that has like all but forgotten them, right? Like those are all the complexities like of these men and how can I as an artist, right, make this work? And so for me, it was really thinking about the tropes that were being used in the paintings that I seen at the National Portrait Gallery, in the ways in which military men were being photographed and then also applying those things to these portraits that I was then gonna make. And so I spent about um, like two, three years um, making these portraits and thinking about these portraits. Um, and um, I don't like for me, what was really fascinating is really hearing them talk about um, the ways in which they um, they gather, the ways in, the ways in which. Uh, they document their service, like in the in the war, right? And so, um, what what happened is, if you can recount what you did in the war, and if somebody can then verify another um, a monk soldier can verify what you did in the war, that's how you were then ranked. Um, and then, oftentimes, what happened too during that time during two thousand and. Um, uh, 13, 2014, 2015, Obama had signed this, um, Obama had signed this law, right, the Stolen Valors Act. Uh, he had just signed this into law, and the law was that um, you could not uh, 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 pretend to be a, a soldier and you could not um, you know, like, uh, and that you could not um, uh, use this to 
gain um, any sort of favors or uh, or money. And Hmong people were like really scared, especially these men. And I remember being um, having this exhibition, knowing that this exhibition was going to take place. Um, I remember having a conversation with one of the Hmong elders, and he was really afraid of what was going to happen to these men, right? And so I just thought, wow, what a what a really interesting thing to think about, like you know, like these men fought in a war that has all but forgotten about them, that sort of really didn't want to forget about them. They're trying to reinsert themselves into a war that has forgotten about them. And yet here they are afraid of wearing the um, the military uniforms that they uh, that that they might have gotten had they been um, recognized by the United States government um, and afraid of like getting, getting arrested like there's something really wrong about that for me um, and I think like for me um, this body of work really is talking about what it means to um, to want to be recognized what it means to um, uh, what it means to um, to be among like an Hmong elder um, in in this um, in this time, right? Um, you know what's really um, interesting is that these men they all belong to a um, like a, a Lao Hmong American uh, like um, Vietnam veterans group, right? And the, there's like these fees that they have to pay every month. Right, and then also they like there's like a lobbyist that they have that works for them on a like a state level and a um, a local level and like a federal level, right? And in in a lot of the times, like what they want is they want to be recognized, right? It's all it's very much about the recognition that is very important for them, right? And how does the state? How can a state recognize you, right? And um, and so. This, for me, is um, something that I, you know, I think that um, I, um, I often think about, like this man with this purple heart, right? Um, he had bought this purple heart on, on eBay, um, but like, you know, had he been recognized by the United States Army, would he have gotten a purple heart? I don't know, maybe. You know, but we we will never know because he's not recognized by the United States um, uh, government as um, as a veteran, right? Um, and so this is the work. Um, this work was um, shown at uh, uh, what is now known as Mia, um, and here's some shots of of the work. Um, it's relatively it's hung relatively high. Um, so that when you walk up to it, there's this sort of uh, like a like a um, you have to tilt your head, and you know there's you know um, um, thinking about I'm thinking about shrines and um, what it means to like honor somebody, and um, and so those are all the things that are in uh, in this work, and the reasons why it's like hung relatively high. I'm also really interested in. Uh, the metals that they buy and that they like that they buy that they source that they then sometimes make themselves right so um, the long uh, necklace is a metal that was made um, by um, General Ving Pao given to his army you know and some um, they've like buy off of eBay secondhand stores and some they make themselves and so um, that is that work um, the next body of work is titled My Mother's Flowers, and it's very straightforward. So you'll, you'll notice that like my, um, um, uh, my titles for my bodies of work are very much like very family and very like oriented, but also very, um, uh, uh, very personal. Um, and I, you know, I think that that, that, that is um, very important for me, um, but um, in um, you know when I was making uh, the veterans work, I had just graduated from uh, my graduate program, and I was back at home, and I was trying to think about like what the kind of work that I could make in Minnesota, and especially like the work that I was making, like what I could be making at home, and I. Um, my mom, I like, I talk about my mom um, uh, because I think she's like such a, she's like 
a crazy woman, but then she's also like kind of like the best mom too, right? Um, and um, and so um, my mom, uh, I have like these like really like. Uh, like distinct memory of like my mom loving like flower arrangements and um, like loving flowers, florals in general, but she would never buy fresh floral arrangements. She would always buy fake floral arrangements and sometimes she would go and get them at the thrift store. Sometimes she would go to the dollar store and she would buy like a handful, bring them back home and arrange them. And so she would like create this sort of um, like American dream oasis for us at home and I think like in in her in, like as an adult like it like thinking about it now like I feel like my mom would like create these um, like environment these like mo like this American dream moments for us in our houses and this was like um, inspired by like Martha Stewart right we would be home and Martha Stewart would be on and we'd be watching her and in a way my like she is like the epitome of what um, like of what every like good Hmong woman should be she's able to clean she like uh, cooks and you know she like does all these things she's like very domesticated and um, and I think like 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 she's like if she was Hmong, she would be like the perfect Hmong woman, right? Um, and so I think a lot about like Martha Stewart living and these like floor arrangements that she has and that my mom tries to like, um, tries to make, right? And so we, we had a bunch of floral arrangements. Um, and I was, so I, I had thought about that, but at the same time, I was um, also, um, this is like in like, 2000, right after graduate school, like 2012, 2013, um, there was this website, toshia.com. And um, I was like completely enamored by this website. This is a dating website that connected Hmong American men with Hmong, with Hmong Laotian girls. Um, this was like before Facebook became like the new like dating site for uh, for um, for this for Hmong American men and Hmong Malaysian girls um, but what was really wonderful about this website two things right like that like uh, like people in Laos were uploading their photographs in, onto this website and then Hmong American men would go on this website. It was easy, if you knew how to write toshia.com on the URL, you can go into the URL and before like in, like pre, um, pre like pandemic, right, uh, the website was like super user friendly. It's not so user friendly today, but back then in like 2012, 2013, it was like super user friendly. So you would just go, and look at like pictures of people. And it was, and, and if there was a picture that you like, you put your mouse over it, and then their number would come up, and then you could call them, you could buy a phone card, and you could call them. And it was like really easy like that. And I was really like interested in like that aspect of how easy that was. But also, what was that, what the thing that I was really interested in was, um, I was really interested in the use of Photoshop and the ways in which these girls were photographing themselves, the decisions to put like these photographs up on the website, right? And so um, just to go back, like I think like the dominant narrative with Hmong American men um, for like why uh, they needed to go overseas to look for like these pure Hmong girls uh, were often because like these girls were like, you know, like didn't have like Western ideology. They were like purely Hmong girls from Toshia, right, from the hills of Laos and that um, they like embody what a like a Hmong woman should be, right? And that like they were like devoid of these like Western influences, right? And so there's like, th there was like that conversation. Um, but what was, fascinating for me was that these girls then were like 
photoshopping their faces, making themselves whiter, giving themselves these European nose bridges. You know, they were like oftentimes photographing themselves next to these, um, you know, uh, greenery and floral. And like, you know, there's this long history with the uh, the body, the female body, as it relates to like, um, you know, next to um, florals. Uh, you know, thinking about like the body as a vessel, the body as this fruitful thing, and I I feel like in some ways, like these ladies were uh, uh, were subconsciously making themselves more desirable, both like uh, in on the surface, and then also like the ways in which they were um, uh, partnering their bodies next to these floors. And so I was like really interested in the sort of thinking about this uh, from like a photographic um, standpoint. And so what I was doing was I would go, I was like obsessed with this website. I would go on this website every day because they would have like top 100 clicks. And so I would go on the website and I would look at all the clicks and I would then, uh, anything that was like interesting for me, I would then screen grab it and I would, say, I, and then I would put it in a folder and say, okay, I'm gonna use this as a reference for um, an image that I'm making or, um, you know, in some ways I was gonna use this. And so um, I was on this website like every day for uh, like for a couple of months and I was just completely obsessed. And what I was noticing myself doing was I was collecting images that were of girls in some sort of next to some sort of flora. And I was also thinking about like, um, uh, like Hmong traditional portraiture too, right? So I was like looking at that. And so um, this, um, my mother's flower consists of three types of images, black and white still lives of flowers that my mother collected that lived in our house um, and that like um, and then also um, uh, appropriate images green grabs from the stating website and then um, using the images from the stating website as reference to making my own um, um, images um, and so the black and whites you know I'm thinking about you know Dutch still life paintings um, and then there are these like really beautiful, crazy um, portraiture, um, you know, that in a lot of ways resemble traditional Hmong portraiture too, right? And so um, a, a, a history about, a really short history about Hmong portraiture. Um, Hmong portraiture came to Laos in the 1940s when the French colonized Laos. Uh, and with it, they brought with them these like portable studio portraiture. And oftentimes you'll find um, a painted backdrop of a mountainscape and then uh, two floral arrangements would anchor the sitter, right? And so this was is something uh, that started in the 1940s that continue even to this day. So that was a reference, the image before that was a res reference image, and then this is um, the image that I made using that reference image. So I really like this idea of like mixing the work and mixing these sort of different styles of photography or thinking about these different ways in which um, photographs are, um, are made. I think about oftentimes like the language, right? Like I'm really interested in like the language of photography and how I can use that to uh, make the image um, or make the body of work more complex. Um, but oftentimes, like, I mean, so for me, like, this body of work is very much about, I'm really interested in sort of like the, plasti the plasticity of the, uh, of, of the flower, right? The idea that like, um, that like something so beautiful can last forever, right? Um, in plastic and also like in, um, in Laos, plastic is like everywhere, um, especially plastic flowers, uh, silk flowers. You'll see more silk flower shops than you'll see real flower, real floral shops. Like, I mean, and that to me is kind of bunkers and like, but also is so real of like the, um, the, the, the world that is Laos, right? Like, so like, like how can any like how can any person see this image and think oh yeah well like there's a really beautiful woman who's standing next to a plant that maybe is like a disease plant like you know like where is the translation in that right and so like for me i'm like 
that for me is um, is the thing that is um, that I'm interested in, right? Um, And so my mother still has a lot of these plants. They're like in our basement, in like the corner of our basement. Um, she does not throw them away. And so this work was um, exhibited at the Bokley Gallery in Minneapolis in, um, in 2000 and um, like 15. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, a, a, I think like for the first time too, this body of work for me uh, was my attempt at thinking about photography more conceptually um, and thinking about ways in which I can bring different languages together and, um, and talk about um, like different, uh, things are maybe a lot more complex. Um, and okay, so uh, my grandfather turned to a tiger is an exhibition that was um, exhibited in 2018 at the um, Midway Contemporary Arts. And I, you know, like very much like all the bodies of work that I have, like it is very much about um, thinking about a story and then like what are the different ways in which I can then enter this, um, the world of the story through photography, right? And so, um, in 2016, um, I uh, I had a aunt that was uh, had colon cancer and um, was um, gonna uh, like pass away, and so um, I just like I, and she was the mother-in-law of one of my best friends, and so um, I uh, you know I saw her and. Um, she knew my grandfather. Uh, I, so my grandfather died uh, when my dad was relatively young, and so my dad doesn't have a lot of memory of my grandfather, and so he doesn't talk about my grandfather at all to us. So I knew very little about my grandfather, um, and it was like during this time that she told me this like really beautiful story about my grandfather. I don't know if it's true or not, um, um, and I remember asking my dad about this uh, like. Uh, like about this story, and my dad like can like wouldn't give me like a straight answer. But the story is that when my grandmother and my grandfather got married in the um, early '60s, they had uh, my dad and his four brothers. And um, shortly after uh, my uh, my fourth uncle was born, um, General Vang Pao came through their uh, uh, town, asked the, the men to go and fight and my grandfather went reluctantly. And uh, shortly after he went, he stepped on a mine and he died. And that when he died, a tiger came into my grandmother's village and uh, stayed with my grandmother. And the, um, the villagers believed that that was my grandfather. Right? So I heard this story and I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna go to Laos and I'm gonna like, I'm gonna like, I'm gonna make the story. like. I just like, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna make the story. Like, I'm gonna like photograph the narrative of the story, right? And so um, I went to Laos with my husband and we, uh, I like started making, like I started photographing um, and I was like having such a hard time making photographs of this story. And I think because um, my previous body of work, I had worked so um, like on a much more like theme base and was really not thinking about documentary photography, was really thinking much more about conceptual photography. I was having a really hard time sort of bringing the story to life. And so I started really thinking about what are the different ways in which, like what are the themes in the story that like really like captured me, right? And so I was really thinking about ideas of love and um, desire and loss. And um, I was thinking about like magic tricks and what it means to um, like be disillusional and to have illusions, right? And so I started, I, so the, the work is very much based on these themes. Um, uh, some of the work is in, uh, are lenticulars. Um, and so at that time too, I was like, um, like, like it's like bodies of work within bodies of work, 
This work is titled uh, My Grandmother's Favorite Grandchild. Um, and it's um, a portrait that my grandmother had commissioned when she was in the refugee camps of my cousin who was not able to come to the United States. Um, and so my grandmother had this photograph commissioned, she, uh, brought it with her, and it lived with her in every bedroom that she lived in. And we all knew that this was my grandmother's favorite grandchild uh, because it was like the only photograph that lived with her. Um, and so when she passed away, I asked my dad if I could have it. And my dad said, sure. I my dad gave it to me. and it, it lives with me now, and I think like uh, at some point I was having a conversations with my sisters and my cousins, and I was like, wouldn't it be great if we were all my cousin, yeah. my all my grandmother's favorite grandchild? And so uh, this is like where this body of work comes from, right? And so there's like nine of us girls uh, then, and so there are nine of these images. Um, but they live in this body of work, um, I think, because they have sort of the same themes, right? Um, this is also like uh, that t the time where I was also really thinking about what a Hmong country looked like, and um, I like was then started making this work too. But also then this work came sort of became its own body of work that I'll talk about after this. Um, but. I was really thinking about like what a narrative can potentially look like um, uh, that is not linear, right? So can I give you a prompt that says, you know, can the prompt just be my grandfather turned into a tiger and can you walk into a room and can you like devise your own story with that prompt? You know, like that to me is something that I was like really, really um, like curious about um, and so, you know, um, some of this work is uh, our lenticular base, right? So like lenticular is a sort of flat image that has this sort of 3D quality, very kitsch. Uh, usually like we give it to kids, right? And so, but I wanted to see what it would look like as a really big image. And so like, you know, some of this, this is an image. Um, I was also really interested in thinking about like, um, like constructing, right, the idea of construction, both um, uh, a physical form and then also like as like a metaphor too. Um, and so a lot of these are like, yeah, constructions. Um, also, I think too that it's really important to note that the way the work was um, hung in the gallery was very, you know, um, I'd use wheat paste. I wheat pasted the work onto the walls. And there's something really wonderful about the way in which, like, work gets wheat pasted on the wall. They're not always perfect. Sometimes there are bubbles. There's sometimes they're not straight, um, you know. And so, um, and then they also, like, uh, take on the the history of that wall too, right? So whatever the imperfections that are on that wall then gets um, uh, crossed over into like the photographs. And I really like that there is this history, that, 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 that this history then is like transfer over. And then also that, um, in that, um, that after the work, that the work isn't precious. I think like that's something that's really important for me. Um, as somebody who is brought up like in like traditional photography to like to like, you know, that that photography is something that is meant to be behind class, uh, glass and then also hung out on the wall. I wanted to really break away from that, I think too, because one um, I think uh, like I've always felt like as a person of color, the museums have always been really like inaccessible for me, right? And then also like, um, you know, um, and, and then also to think about like this, um, like, yeah, like this item, like, right? Like isn't necessarily always um, precious, you know? And so I was working with that Yeah, so I often think about these um, subjects as sort of characters in, like, um, like in this story, right? Like, yeah, like the th um, the mom, the grandma, the men, you know, these kids, um, 
Yeah, like, so for me, they become really, really important. Um, and then also, like, thinking about, um, thinking about the way in which my viewers, like, engage in the photographs, too, right? Like, that viewer engagement, for me, becomes really important. And, like, not engaging in the ways in which, like, people are thinking about photography, but, like, how are you physically going into a space and how are you physically looking at work? Like, can the work, can you be enveloped in the work, right? Do you need to move in closer to look at, a, a, at an image because an image is smaller? Do you need to move back to look at an image, right? So thinking about that very first um, project that I show you, um, the military portraits, where you need to go, and in order for you to look at the image, you need to go up close and tilt your head up. This is very much like a dance. So my viewers were really much, I was really thinking about this space as sort of a, a very performative too, right, um, uh, for my viewers. So um, this body of work, After the Fall of Mong Te Cho, um, is a body of work about um, this Hmong man. His name is Sang Zhang. And um, in like early 2015, um, he had swindled a bunch of Hmong elders in the Twin Cities, um, promising them that he was in conversations with the United Nation, the Obama administration, and uh, the Lao government to buy like a large piece of land in Laos um, as a Hmong country for Hmong elders, and that you can buy into this uh, plan, uh, into this country. You can be a founding member if you, uh, there are these tiers of payments that you can make, right? And so he had like he had like gone around and he had like tried us. He had sold these these ideas, and people had you know people believed him. Uh, he had stacks of paper, uh, you know, that he was uh, drafting up. Um, and uh, what ultimately happened was the F uh, somebody had told on him, the, F the FBI tried to investigate, was having a really hard time investigating because Hmong people were not going to tattle on the sky. And so what they did was they actually came into the Twin Cities, had a town hall meeting with Hmong elders, uh, clan members, and said, you know, like, this is what we're investigating. Can you please go back into your communities and talk to people to see who have been swindled? and if they would be willing to come forward and um, let us interview them. And so I remember this being a really big thing. Um, don't know what became of it, but ultimately what happened was this man was arrested in LA, coming back from Laos, and then um, uh, was extradited back to Minnesota, uh, stood trial, uh, was convicted, but also like at the same time, was then like uh, there was like his Hmong supporters, right, that came out and like supported him too, and like really believed that um, the American government was trying to not let this happen because they didn't want Hmong people to have a country, you know, and not and really looking the other way when there were like plenty of evidence that he was actually taking this money and like using it on himself and doing things that he wasn't supposed to do with this money, right? And so he had swindled over $2 million. I mean, it's crazy. Um, and so I heard this story and I was like, oh my God, crazy. I, I like, I wanna make work about this, but how do I make work about this, right? And so like really, again, thinking about um, the story, thinking about the dreams and the hopes of these Hmong elders. Um, and so I, um, I, this is a picture of me and my sister, uh, who's also here in the audience. Um, and so um, I remember like really early on, like my parents would take us all the time to the Como Conservatory in Minnesota, and I never understood why we would go to the Como Conservatory. We would go to the Como Conservatory, and my parents would take us into the tropical area of the conservatory. We would like sit and we would, my parents would like meet with their friends and their family and sometimes my dad would tell us the plants, you know, that were like native to Laos and I never understood that, right? Um, and it wasn't until I became like an adult that I realized that the Como, Conserva the Como Conservatory for my parents at that time in the early 90s was really the only place in Minnesota that like reminded them of home, of Laos. Um, you know, it was this sort of really 
beautiful place. Like I think about this place both metaphorically and like in its like physical space too, right? Like here's a glass house that has like climate control uh, temperatures that houses uh, non-Minnesota native plants, right? Like that these like transplants plants that are in this space, right? And like how like how great to think about this space in relationship to like the countless Hmong refugees or the countless refugee communities that are that that live in Minnesota. And so I I think about that a lot. And so it's decided that I would go and like would photograph this place, right? This place that um, could be a jungle scape. But you know, if you're not looking close enough, and you're not paying attention to like maybe um, the um, the 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 you know the tops of the images or the bottoms of the images or like even piercing enough into the images, you might not know that this is not a jungle scape and that this is actually um, you know in 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 a controlled space. And at the same time. Um, my mother worked at works at a senior daycare center, and um, I was really thinking about well, like this country or this uninhabited country. What would this look like? Could this look like? Can I make a country out of the house plants, the domesticated house plants that were at the senior daycare center? Can I make this country? And can I have people um, like be in the photographs, right? And so I started really thinking about like this jungle scape and what this could potentially look like. How can I use the things that I have on hand to make these photographs um, to talk about you know, um, uh, l country and longing for country, you know, um, and so um, this is this is the work that came out of it. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, uh, I also am like trying to swindle my viewers the same way this man has swindled Hmong elders, right? In that, like, if you're not looking close enough at the edges, and if you're not looking close enough in the photographs, you might miss that, like the um, the, the the landscapes, the jungle scapes are not in the jungle, and that these portraits, um, that these plants are not um, real plants. They're all fake plants, right? And so there's like this. Um, for me, um, there's a like a level of required looking, right? Uh, uh, to like to see this, and um, I I don't know I really there's something about this required looking, you know, um, same as the sort of required examination of this man and his paperwork, his like stacks upon stacks of paperwork that is needed in in thinking about what a Hmong country can be or what it might possibly look like. All right, so this body of work um, is titled The Imaginative um, Landscape Among Homeland. And I just like want to talk really briefly about the imaginative landscape. Um, so uh, there is a historian, um, Victor, um, 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 Valerie Flink, who studied um, Cliff Christopher Columbus and what Christopher Columbus was thinking about before he came to the Americas. And uh, she found that um, he was looking at um, at, at, at drawings, he was he was reading journals. He was asking um, anybody who would sail west what uh, the Americas could potentially look like, uh, and what he could potentially uh, what could potentially be in store for him. And with that, when he came to the Americas, because he had sort of this envision of what um, the Americas was going to look like, uh, when he came to the Americas, uh, it was absolutely nothing like what he had. Uh, Thought it was going to be, um, and so um, uh, hence coined this term, the imaginative landscape. Um, I I took the term and I'm using it for myself because 
I often think about Laos, and um, I I have a really great relationship with my maternal grandmother, who has since passed away. Um, but oftentimes, like my sister and I would fight over who gets to sleep with her, and I often would win. And I would often ask her questions about Laos. You know, what was it like growing up in Laos? You know, how was what was like? Can you like, you know, um, like tell me like what the landscape was like? You know, and she would tell me these like really beautiful stories about what it was like growing up in Laos, um, hardships, dating, you know, her long walks to um, the um, uh, the garden, uh, what was inside the jungles, right? She would like say all this stuff to me. And so I had this sort of um, idea of what Laos was like. And uh, when I went to Laos, it was absolutely nothing like what she had explained to me, uh, right? And so I felt like, in a way, I was sort of like, think like the mindset was very similar to like what I, as, like, you know, um, assume Christopher Columbus was thinking when he came to the Americas, right? Um, uh, but what I realized too that my grandmother was really not talking about Laos like as like as like a landscape. She was like really talking about a period in like her life, you know, um, and this was a period um, like uh, uh, like right before, really before the war, right? Uh, when opium cultivation was uh, at its highest peak in Laos. And so um, I, I, I think about this body of work as like a research body of work, you know, where I was really thinking about going back to Laos and like, yeah, what would this, like, what would the jungle look like? Um, thinking about this period about uh, of, of, of opium cultivation, right? Um, and so um, this for me is very much setting up um, um, ultimately what I've been, I think I've been trying to do for um, a long period of, of my practice. And that is to, um, yeah, like set up um, an imagined idea of what a, a, like a home country can look like, utilizing um, like uh, tropes that I have, like I'm always really interested in and have been utilizing, but then also thinking about like the people that are like in this space, right? Um, and you'll see that um, like the opium as like an iconic um, like uh, artifice like shows up like over and over again. Um, and that to me becomes really important um, in, in, in like in the work I think. Um, And I think like for me, like the, I think about the opium um, a lot because I think from, uh, because like opium cultivation, like in the context of like Hmong history, um, there's something really like um, really great about that in that like it was like at the height of um, opium cultivation that Hmong people were really recognized like in the Laos like government where they had like money for the first time, they were given seats at the table for the first time, they could send their kids to their sons to school for the first time and it was like it was because of like the opium um, uh, opium farming that like people were able to do that. And so um, and I bring this up because um, in this um, like the last body of work. Um, this is my attempt at growing opium in Minnesota, in like <laughs> northern uh, Laos, I mean northern Minnesota. And I feel like this is such a like fascinating image as a document, but then also like as a metaphor too, right? Like that like, like here is the opium, but also here are all the native Minnesota like plants, right? That like takes over, and it's a sort of um, this uh, contest to see um, who can overpower the other. Um, but um, I want to end by talking about this body of work, which is like the latest body of work, um, titled "Pakwandu um, Flowers of the Sky," um, and so um, I. 
in 2018, I was doing research for um, a show that I had in, um, in, at the Orc Gallery in Vancouver, and I came across this article um, titled, California's Green Rush Takes Hmong Back to Their Opium Growing Roots. Right, and so uh, essentially, this article was talking about a very specific area in Northern California, um, by the, um, in Mount Shasta in the Siskiyou um, County, and they were talking about how um, there was an influx of Hmong growers that were growing um, uh, marijuana illegally, um, and that the local government was really having a hard time uh, containing. Uh, this um, this group of Hmong growers, um, but then also that like Hmong elders were uh, flocking to this area and utilizing their uh, agricultural knowledge um, to uh, to grow marijuana. Very prosperous too. Um, uh, you know, I think like during at the height of the California Green Rush, uh, we've had maybe more millionaires than we probably have ever had in like the history of Hmong, uh, like Hmong, Hmong people, I think. Um, you know, but that's also really short lived, right? Um, and so just to give you a context, the X is where I was um, making work and where that, um, that article was like, uh, was very much talking about. And so really at the bed of like Mount Shasta. And in that article, the local um, uh, uh, sheriffs talked about how these Hmong people were uh, uh, like, um, they were like this militia group and they were, you know, they had developed their own system of governing and um, security and it was in, incredibly hard to penetrate this group. And so what they were doing was they were um, going on Google Earth and looking to see like the kind of activities that were being, that Hmong, these Hmong, you know, uh, militia group was like having, right? And so I was like, I wanna see what that looks like. And so I did, I went on Google Earth and I started looking at like this very specific area, you know? And so um, it just so happened too that um, right at the height of the pandemic, um, the world sort of shut down and, you know, I couldn't photograph people. And so um, I uh, had a trip down to California and decided that I wanted to go and really explore this place. Um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to, uh, the kind of photographs that I was going to have or that I was going to make, but I was like really interested in thinking about this place as a landscape, you know, but also before that I was like looking at like, um, you know, I think as a photographer, oftentimes when you're making work about a certain place, you're, you're wanting always to see who's photographed it and how have they photographed this place so that you can learn, take away, and maybe not make the same kind of photographs, you know? So I was looking at the works of, of um, Carlton Watkins, um, Timothy O'Sullivan, and then most uh, notably, Enzo Adams, right? And what I found is that what they were doing was they were really photographing California in the West as sort of a way to entice settlers to move westward, right? And like during the gold rush and saying, look at all this land, it's so expansive and like it's beautiful and like it hasn't been settled and you should move westward so you can, you know, like there's all these opportunities, right? And so I was really thinking about them in the ways in which they were making work for the public, right? And so I was like really thinking about um, going in and photographing this landscape. Although I'm really interested in um, like the marijuana operation, um, I wasn't really interested in like particularly photographing um, uh, marijuana or these marijuana plants or the marijuana growers, right? I was really thinking about the landscape, the land. You know, and I think too that um, uh, there's something really fascinating about, you know, the history of this land as it like exists on its own, and then also the history of the people that have lived on this land before Hmong people came and bought the land up, and then also like the history of Hmong people too, right? And so, you know, um, you know that Hmong people were chased out of, of of China. They came into Laos. You know, the Laos people said. Uh, 
you can stay in Laos, but you can't live in the lowlands. You have to like do whatever you can in the on the side of the mountains, you know. And so they, you know, Hmong people lived on the side of mountains. They were able to make the side of mountains very prosperous for them, right? And so there's sort of this recycled history, right, of of, of Hmong people given you know, and taking up spaces that nobody wanted, and then also like um, through resiliency and agricultural knowledge, been able to be very prosperous with the things that they were given, right? And so I was like thinking about that and uh, like wanting to talk about that, you know? Um, I don't know, like I often think like, um, yeah, like I want those things and I want to talk about those things, but like do they exist in, the photographs that I'm making. Can I talk about these things in the photographs that I'm making? And I think, like for me, that is a constant conversation that I like have with myself as a photographer. You know, I'm also really interested in the environmental impacts of the space, right? So, like, you know, California had a drought in 2020. There, in 2021, there were the lava fires, right? Um, and then also, um, you know, what are the um, like uh, social justice or social um, uh, uh, things that were happening like in this community too, right? So, you know, uh, during the lava fire, one of uh, a Hmong man was shot and killed by a police officer. Historically, this place has always been really racist. They continue to be racist. You know, um, right before the lava fires, there was um, they had a water restriction. Right, the water restriction was very specific to this one very specific area that where most of the uh, Hmong people uh, lived, right? And so, sort of, and, and and then also thinking about like this land, it's just agricultural land. It can't be resident land, residents. You know, in order for you to have residents on this land, you need to, you know, uh, have a septic and have a well and in order for you to have a septic in a well you need to go to a local government and you need to apply for these permits and you know and in order for you to apply for these permits you have to understand the language right and so there's like all these like barriers that happens that prevents uh among people that are like that own this land from actually like um being residents of this uh, town, but then also like prevents them from like uh, making policies that um, will like help them. And so like there's like all these layers that I'm very interested in. Um, but then also, how do I talk about that in a photograph? How can I make a photograph that is not documentary that can be conceptual, um, that can exist in uh, a way? that can open doors to talk about these different things. Um, I think that that's, that was like the question that I gave myself. I don't know if, um, I don't know if I like answered that and I don't know if these photographs like uh, answered those questions, but I think like those are all very uh, like present in uh, like the way in which I'm thinking about the work. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, just, I'll give you some uh, exhibition uh, photos. Um, you know, so um, uh, Mount Chesta in the background, but in the foreground, these opium flowers that I grew up in, um, uh, in Minnesota. You know, the work has, um, you know, uh, these um, light boxes that like, sit, it's like the light boxes become really seductive. They seduce you in, right? And they leave you looking and wanting more, but also like ultimately you're having to really think about like this this landscape and to, like to ponder on it. Um, there's also a two channel video, um, Gutsia, this sort of back and forth, right? Um, uh, Kao Kalia, this amazing Hmong writer in Minnesota, has um, coined the term song poet. And I think that that's what they are. They're these really beautiful poetry sung to each other. Um, and um, 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 among women in America and among man in Laos sings Gutsia back and forth to each other about um, wanting to be here in America and about wanting to be back in Laos. And um, yeah, I think that is the like the most um, current work that I have. And I think like I'd be more than happy to like answer any questions that you may have too. I th thank you very much for your talk. I just wondered whether 
you could talk about the work specifically that was in home, mm. the portrait of the woman with the foliage behind her? Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um, so, so that body of work was um, in um, the um, um, after the fall of Meng Teichou, um, and uh, that work was um, the portraits were actually made at the senior daycare that my mother works at, and um, you know uh, that that style of portraiture, um, you know, uh, is a style of portraiture that is very near and dear to Hmong studio portraiture in general, right? And so, like, oftentimes, um, and you know, I, I talked about this, um, like, being that it was really from the French that Hmong people like got this sort of studio portraiture, um, and so um, oftentimes, what you'll see um, in these traditional um, sort of studio portraiture is you'll see a painted mountainscape. Um, oftentimes it is a painted mountainscape. Um, in this day and age, it's like a digital like mountainscape, um, and it's a, a painted mountainscapes, and then uh, you'll have the sitter in the middle, and you'll have um, an anchor, um, and the anchors will often be um, uh, florals, uh, oftentimes fake florals. And so, you know, I'm drawing on like those, that history of Hmong uh, studio portraiture, and I'm thinking about um, like the jungle scape too, what, like, what would it look like if a Hmong woman had just like, w we're in the jungle and like, what could a jungle, like, what, it, what could a jungle portrait look like, you know? Um, yeah, I'm like, I wanna do that and I, I have done that, but I think that there's something for me really fascinating and really interesting about using domesticated plants um, uh, plants that are not native to Laos, but can be easily recognizable in um, in America, right? Um, house plants, fake house plants, um, and like, how can I like? Can I? You know, the the for me the um, for me the um, uh, uh, the question is always: Can I make a photograph? You know, can I make something? Uh, with the things that I have. Like, can I make a photograph that um, uh, talks about the things that I'm interested on based on the things that I have? And so that is always like, um, uh, that is always for me like uh, a question and it's always a challenge, right? And so, you know, I was very much interested in like recreating that. And so that's what that was. Hi, thank you so much for coming. My question actually revolves around the idea of resolution. Um, it's very evident that in your work that um, it feeds, f that one project feeds into another and feeds into another and you use that to inform so much of where your future process goes. Do you ever feel like a project can find resolution or if you are seeking resolution in any of your bodies? Mm, I love that you use the word resolution. Um, because oftentimes the work starts out asking a question, right? And I think that my work for me often is about asking questions and like thinking about, um, like thinking about ideas that maybe are not, um, uh, that like sometimes don't always, um, like the ending never is oft, is never what, I set out to ask, right? Um, and so it's. I think it's uh, yeah, like really fascinating that you use the word resolution, um, because I don't, I don't know if any of the work that I make have any like if they're ever resolved. You know, they might be resolved in the sense that um, I stop like at some point, like that body of work ends, and I don't like I don't return to it. Um, but I think like that for me is a resolution, you know. But I, oftentimes too, I think about like, um, like the recreation, right? I feel like I'm always making or thinking about the same thing over and over again, you know. I mean, I think I realized too that like I'm really interested in ideas of like homeland, like what is a homeland. Like, why are Hmong people so obsessed with needing, wanting a country of their own? What is it about that, you know, that keeps us continuously wanting that, right? And so, yeah, I, yeah, I find that 
Like, yeah, I mean, and, and I think that it's, um, there are definitely through lines in the work, right? But um, I don't know. I don't know if it's ever resolved. I don't know, I don't know if I can ever resolve that, you know, if there's, if there's ever a resolution for that. Hi, Pahua. Thank you so much for the talk and for sharing your body of work. Yes. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm going to ask the question about space and intention. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've asked, I want to ask, when you're sort of um, invited to the spaces like the Momoka here mm -hmm. in Madison, um, and these are sort of predominantly places that, you know, sort of don't feature folks like you. And I will be honest that I'm only here in Momoka tonight because of you, so I'm here for you, right? Yeah. And so I'm wondering what you hope the exchange is, right, when you come to these spaces yeah. and you talk about your work, and what is your intention for that kind of exchange for someone like you and I to have, right? Because we're both Hmong and we mm -hmm. ask the same kind of Hmong questions from our own Hmong ex experiences and lived perspectives. And then, you know, what is the exchange that you hope to have with folks who are not Hmong? and mm. who might be encountering Hmong, a Hmong person, a Hmong artist, and actually Hmong subjects for the very first time? Yeah, that's such a great question because, you know, so I, I oftentimes get asked the question of like, who is this work for? Like, who is this work for? And, you know, I, I often, I, I think I used to say, well, actually it's for everybody, but actually it's not, right? Like, I think I make the work specifically for Hmong people um, with the understanding that uh, that like Hmong people today might not get it, you know, and that like it's gonna require uh, like um, like further generations to maybe understand the work, to maybe digest the work, right? So like that for me, like I think like that for me in like very recently has been um, like more um, like um, more present than anything, right? But, um, but also like. I went to a graduate program that like knew very little about Hmong people, and uh, I think I could have said whatever I wanted to say, and they would have believed me. And you know, and, and like I like completely like and didn't know how to talk about my work, and didn't know what my work was about, and then at some point like really confused me too, right? Because I was like. Wait, but I want to be like this other white person, and but I like you know, but I I want to you know, so it was like really hard, right? And so, um, for me, um, right, like so for me, like being able to be here um, and being be, being able to uh, present this work here um, is um, quite an honor in that like I'm able to talk about the things that I want to talk about, the things that are important to me. Um, I understand that like not everybody understands like, you know, uh, marijuana cultivation as it relates to opium cultivation and that like that 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 like maybe for the first time you're hearing that there is a sort of connection, right? And and that like I'm able to like that I can teach you that or I can say that to you and you can say, Oh, I wanna learn more about this so I can go back home and think about this, right? Or or that like uh like or that Hmong people don't have a country and but that that is very present on our mind, you know, and you know, or, so there's like there's like all these things, right? And I, I recognize too that for uh for a lot of my audience, um, I don't know, for as long as I've had audience that like I'm probably ever gonna maybe be the first and maybe the only Hmong person that you encounter and that this work is gonna maybe be the only Hmong artwork that you encounter for a while, you know? And, and so I used to think that I have a responsibility to be a representative of the Hmong people, right? But I don't think that I, I don't think like that anymore. I think that like the work for me is, um, uh, very diaristic, like it is very personal to me, um, and that like in that it is very um, important to me as like a Hmong woman in my own community, um, but that like also like not every um, Hmong person feels or thinks the same way I do, and that like that our um, our lived experience are you know uh, while they may be similar are vastly different too, and I also recognize too that I come from a very privileged. Uh, position, right? In that, like, I'm able to like have this practice, you know. I'm able to go to the school that I went to, you know. But also, like, you know, like I'm very aware of like this kind of privileges that I have, right? And so, yeah, like I think that um, 
when I'm having a conversation with a museum curator, uh, you know, I'm not only talking about, um, you know, like my own personal history, but then we are then able to talk about like the history of art and maybe like even the history of photography, you know, is very differently than when I'm talking about, you know, to another monk person who maybe is encountering art for the first time, you know, and, you know, I'm then able to talk about, you know, well, this is what I'm interested in doing and maybe this is what this work is, you know, so just to give you a, a like, you know, I had a, um, uh, I had a, a birthday party not that long ago and my, uh, one of my uh, aunts, gave a speech and she was, this is what she said to me. She said, you know, I don't know why you keep on getting awards for those photographs that you make. They're not even all that great, but like continue getting them, right? And like, I say this because I feel like sometimes, all the times, like, uh, yeah, like, um, like people who are not engaged in like the, um, like in my world, like, like we'll look at this and say, what are we looking at? Why is this important, right? Um, but um, yeah, but it is, it is to me, right? And I, I hope that like in some ways, you know, this work can shed light. And so I, to go back, I think that, yeah, like this work is very much about Hmong people for Hmong people and that they might not understand it now and they may not get it now, but my hope is that like, future generations will study it and or maybe not you know but that's the hope yeah again i want to thank you very much paher for oh, this lovely you. presentation